Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome to this um, late afternoon session of the MSR Seminar Talk Series. So I'm, I'm um, pleased to welcome Jan Tretzmans from the Embedded System Institute and the University of Nimying. I know Jan actually already since a couple of years. We both work in the model-based testing area and he is one of the um, um, major uh, founders of part of this work in the model-based testing area, in particular of IOCO, input-output conformance, which is a way how you can describe that uh, reactive or communicating systems um, conform to a given model. And um, yeah, so I think Jan, just take over. I hope it, I'm sure it will be a very interesting talk. Thanks. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Yeah, model-based testing with labeled transition systems. That's the topic of my talk. So I will talk about model-based testing in general a little bit. That's what I will start with. And then I will switch to model-based testing with labeled transition systems. And in particular, what Wolfgang already mentioned is IOCO theory. I will deal with specifications, implementations, models, such kind of things, how you generate test cases. I will come to some tools with model-based testing, some variations of IOCO, some criticism on it, and finally I conclude. And I hope to do that with, within, let's say, one hour more or less. If you have any questions, uh, then please uh, ask them immediately. I think that's the best, and we can have some discussion. The group is not that large that, that would really interrupt presentation. So, um, Model-based testing, that's the beginning. First, perhaps it's good to consider what is testing, or at least what do I consider to be testing. Um, testing for me, and here I'm talking about software, but at Microsoft, of course, everything is software. Uh, testing for me means checking or measuring some quality characteristics of an executing object by performing experiments in a controlled way and with respect to a specification. So testing is not just trying uh, whether the software works. Testing is really defining an experiment and a procedure, how you would like to measure some kind of properties of a system. And you do that in a controlled way. So just monitoring or observing or looking at the system, in my opinion, is not testing. You really define an experiment and you do that in such a way that from that experiment you can really say something about the product, something which you want to know. And also important, testing requires some kind of specification. At the end of a test procedure you would like to say pass or fail, is it correct or not? And that only makes sense if you have in advance specified what you really wanted to have. It's also good to realize that once you're doing testing, there are very many kinds of testing. And it's good to make a distinction between all these different kinds of testing. And so I have given here on these, this slide a number of axes in which you can discriminate different kinds of testing, but there are many more. Um, one of the best known is white box, black box distinction. In white box testing, you're looking inside the product that you're testing. You're using the structure of the product that you're testing. Whereas in black box, the system that you're testing is really, as the name suggests, a black box. So it's a box where you cannot look inside, but just from the outside, from the interfaces, you're testing it. And another important distinction is the different quality characteristic that you can test. I put that here on the, uh, on the left axis. So for example, you can test for reliability, or test for maintainability, or test for security, or test for uh, what is there more? Efficiency, performance, uh, research, resource usage, for example, memory usage. All these kinds are very different kinds of aspects or characteristics that you can test, and all these aspects require different kinds of tests. And, uh, uh, for example, a security test is different from a functionality test. Finally, the last axis that I draw on this slide is that you can test on very many different levels of detail. For example, you can do a unit test, which quite often is white box testing, but you can also do a system test, where you have integrated a lot of components and see whether the system on system level does what it should do. 
Model-based testing, as I will discuss it today, is mainly about, or is all about, testing of functionality. Testing whether the system does what it should do, what has been specified. It's a black box testing method. So you describe, you specify what the system should do, and you try to test that, but you don't look into the details of the system, into the structure of the implementation. And at the moment, at least as I observe it, it's usually applied on an abstraction level, let's call it module testing. And so you test components, modules. At the moment, complete systems, and especially large systems, for that the, mod, uh, the methods are not really uh, well developed enough. The state of the art is not such that you can really use it on that level. Well, model-based testing, a few things that you can say about it. Why would you like to do it? Well, first of all, as we all know, the complexity of software increases and the quality should be higher. Yeah? If the system gets twice as large, you can argue that the testing effort, in principle, should be four times as high. As high. Yeah? It increases exponentially with the number of inputs, for example. If you have more inputs, you should, in principle, test all combinations. And what I see at the moment is that it is very difficult for testers to keep pace with developers. Developers build complexer and complexer systems, but how to test all these things, and especially in the future. Another trend that you can see is more and more abstraction that's necessary. If you develop more complex systems, you cannot be aware of all the details anymore, so you have to have more uh, abstraction. Model-based development is one of the buzzwords nowadays in software development. If you look a little bit more at a theoretical level, then you see that in the past decades, a lot of people from universities have spent a lot of effort in defining formal verification techniques. And that um, um, has, been gone, has gone on for, for at least 40 years now. And that's about proofs, model checking. And Dijkstra was one of the first to start with that. And he said you should prove that your program is correct. But actually, despite 40 years of research, and a lot of people being involved in that, the practical impact of real model checking or theorem proving techniques on practical software development is not that large. In practice, you see still that quality is being checked by testing. And unfortunately, quite often, at an ad hoc and often too late uh, in the project uh, started. Model-based testing, and I will come back to that, it is, has one, is one of the, sorry, it has the potential to combine a little bit testing, the ad hoc way of experimenting with software in order to check whether it's correct, and on the other hand, formal methods, the theory part, because it has some rooting in, in formal methods. So, model-based testing, what is it? I will come back to that and discuss it in more detail. But it's testing with respect to some model, a model of the system that you want to test. And the promises are that it gives you faster, more tests, higher quality tests, and that in particular these tests can be better maintained because you do not have to maintain the tests themselves, but you can just maintain the models. And generated test automatically. So, automated model-based testing, what is it? At least, what is it, what I think that it is? Testing, that's the first thing in model-based testing. Testing means that you have some object that you want to check. Test, as I described before. Black box test, so you give it some inputs, you observe the outputs. And in the old days, and probably still, in a lot of cases, you need a clever human being in order to do the testing. A clever human being who thinks of some nice inputs, observes the outputs, and finally comes with a verdict, pass or fail, whether the system is correct or not. Of course, this is a very human-intensive thing if you do it in this way. So, if something is, takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, what do you do? You try to automate it. Test tools. Test tools help you mainly in executing the test. The current state of the art is that there are a lot of test tools, but if you look in more detail, these test tools 
What they mainly do is they execute tests. And you still need a clever human being who thinks of all these tests, who devises all these tests, and stores them in some database, and then the test tool can take these tests and really execute them. And if also the verdicts or the criteria when to pass a test have been specified in the test, then probably also the verdicts pass-fail can be assigned automatically. Yeah? But you still need somebody who makes all these tests. And in particular, nowadays, when there are a lot of versions and configurations and changes to systems, each time you have to go through all the tests to see which tests are still valid after a change. So what do you do if you need people and if it takes a lot of effort to make tests? You try to automate that. And that's what model-based testing is about. It's about not only executing the tests automatically, but also trying to generate the tests automatically. And generate the tests, you cannot generate them from nothing, so you need something, a specification or a model. An abstract description of the system, of how the system should, be, should work, what it should do, and from this model you try to generate the tests automatically. And then execute them automatically and assign a verdict. But, and that will be a large part of the talk today, once you have such a model, it's not sufficient to just generate the tests. You should also say something about the relation between the model and the real IoT, the implementation on the test, the system that you're testing. And you must say to what it means for a system to conform to that model, to be correct with respect to that model. Otherwise, you can just generate anything from your model and call it a test. But that's not our intention. We want tests that are correct, preferably provably correct. We want some property that, let's say in the limit case, that the system is correct, expressed in this picture by IoT, the implementation on the test, conforms to, conf to the model. So that's, let's say, an expression which expresses the implementation is correct. If and only if the IoT passes the corresponding generated tests, then we can say, that we have valid tests. But in order to do that, we first have to define what it means for an implementation to conform to the model. Of course, this if and only if in practice is not really something you can reach because it would usually mean that you do infinite testing. And so in practice, you separate this and you talk about soundness and exhaustiveness of tests. Soundness means that a test, if it detects an error, you're sure it is an error. And exhaustiveness means that you have all tests, but as probably you all know, for any realistic system, having all possible tests uh, is, is not possible because it usually means an infinite number. So you have to make selections. Well, does this come for free? No, you still need this clever person, because there should be somebody who makes the model. And, but as I said, one of the advantages is then you get the tests automatically from the model. You can also use the model in, for example, model checking or deriving the implementation. And in particular, if there change, is some change in the system, you just have to change your model. And you don't have to, let's say, go through thousands of pages of tests in order to check which tests are still valid after a change of the system. Let's look at the kind of, where does it fit within a kind of development model. I've written here a kind of, yeah, call it waterfall model, but don't read this as uh, phases in a development process, but more as uh, different abstraction levels at which you can talk about your system that you're developing. So somewhere there are some informal ideas, some, some requirements, some wishes, what the system should do. From these, you try to derive, in principle, a specification, followed by a design. You develop code. And finally, there is the realization. Note that I make a distinction between code and realization. Code is the code, the lines of code as you write it. But the realization is the real working product. So that is the CPU, the computer, together with all its devices, together with all libraries, operating system, etc. That is, how the user perceives the system or an environment. Yeah, and this can be quite tricky, for example, in the embedded world, where 
each device has another processor. Interfaces are not always standard. Yeah, so the realization is what you really observe. Let's say the behaving concrete system. And uh, that's also the thing that you want to test. So the green part is the only part which is in the formal world. The things with, of which you can make models. The gray part is the concrete world. That's the real thing that you want to have. And let's say uh, the, the, the upper part is more the world of ideas. So if you want to make models or formalize somehow, then you cannot do that with the informal requirements because they are informal by definition. And the realization, yeah, that's also a real physical product of which you can make a model, but then already you are abstracting. The real thing, as it stands, is, is not a formal thing. So formal verification, if you want to do that, you can just relate these three green, uh, let's call it products. Validation usually refers to the validation with respect to is it really what you want to have? And testing means, and recall my definition, executing the real product, so that is comparing the real product with one of the higher levels of abstraction. But if you want to do model-based testing, then you cannot do that with respect to the informal requirements, because they, by definition, are informal. You, that's not a model. Yeah, it also means, this implies, that if you do model-based testing, it cannot be all. So if you want to test your system with respect to the very initial ideas that your customer had, yeah, then you should not do that with model-based testing, because then already you are interpreting these ideas in a model, and perhaps making errors with respect to that. So this automatic thing only works if you already have a certain level of, of, of preciseness of your, what you want to build, namely a model. So everything taken together, what is model-based testing? That's testing some functional behavior of a black box implementation with respect to some model. And the model is written in some well-defined language. I call that usually a formal language. So that means that there is a formal semantics, formal syntax, such kind of things. But also based on a good and formal definition of correctness. What does it mean when a system is correct? The model is the basis for testing. And from a theoretical perspective, is assumed to be correct. How to get this model correct is outside the realm of model-based testing, in principle, but actually is a larger problem than model-based testing itself. How to define precisely what your customers want, what your product should do. That's usually a more intricate problem than once you have defined that, testing whether the system really implemented conforms to that model. I would like to say a few words in comparing verification and testing, in particular model-based testing or formal testing. So if you do formal verification, which a lot of people here in Microsoft Research do, then you take some kind of system, call it an implementation, the real system, and you want to verify whether it has some properties. But as I said, the real system itself is not amenable to formal verification. So what do you do? You make some abstraction. You make a model of the system in which you abstract from a lot of detail, in which you try to capture the most essential ideas, and actually what you're then doing is you, to che sorry, you check this model with respect to some specification or property. And for example, you do that by means of model checking. And model checking takes a model, some property, and it says whether the property holds for the model or not. But, if you do that, you should always take into account that this is based on the assumption that your model is a valid abstraction of reality. If you make a model and you, in which you just forget about the most important details of your system, then you can prove a lot of nice properties, but it doesn't say anything about your real system. And it's finally the real system that, you're, that you care about. 
And so the basic underlying assumption for model checking or theory improving or whatever you do with models is, if you check the model, the assumption is that the model is valid, that it really captures the essence of reality. If, on the other hand, you look at testing, you have, to, in principle, at a sufficient level of abstraction, the same problem. An implementation, a concrete system, and a specification, and you want to check whether your implementation satisfies this property or conforms to the specification. Again, this implementation is a real thing. The specification is, for example, a formal specification. And what you do now in this setting, is instead of making an abstraction of your real system, so let's say it pull the implementation above this line, as in verification, you now try to push down the specification in the form of tests to the real world. So you try to think of, to make some tests and execute them in the real world, such that from the results of these tests, you can conclude something about this correctness. But, here again, you have the same kind of problems and analogous assumptions. And so, whereas in verification, the assumption was that the model was valid with respect to reality, yeah, here, in a certain sense, you make an assumption that the tests that you derive when executed in the real world indeed is, are a reflection of the properties that you want to test. To say a little bit more about that, you reason about tests and specifications in your formal world, but finally you execute them in your real world. So actually, what you're doing, you're making a kind of what's often referred to as test assumption of test hypothesis, and you're saying actually something like, if I execute a test on my black box real implementation, it behaves the same way as if I would execute it on some kind of model of that system. I don't know this model. I just assume that it exists. And so for each IoT, the real system, I assume that, I, that there exists a model, which I don't know, I mean the concrete instance, I don't know, but I assume that such a model exists, in particular that it is in some certain domain of models, here indicated by mod, such that if I would do an experiment on it, I cannot, uh, it would have the same result as on the real system. Or take another kind of mental experiment, suppose you have two boxes, black boxes, and in the one box you put the real system, and in the other box you put its model, and you do an experiment on both boxes, you will not be able to distinguish between the two boxes. Yeah? You assume that such a model exists. That's written here, on the top line. So, for all possible IUTs, there exists such a model, such that for all possible tests that you can think of, the result of applying this test to the real system or to the model gives you the same result. And that's an assumption on which testing actually is based. And so whereas in verification you have the basic assumption that you can make a valid model of your system, here the basic assumption is that there exists such a model so that at least you can, could reason about it in a formal way. If such a model would not exist, um, does it depend on the power of your modeling language, or how could that happen that, uh, that it would not exist? Okay. Yeah, it's a, an assumption, a kind of hypothesis that it really exists. Okay. If, it, if it does not exist, then you have chosen the wrong setting of your testing. Uh, if, you, um, if you assume that, a mo that, that if you take a modeling language, for example, to model bridges, uh, drawings or houses or something like that, which are in a completely different domain than, for example, software, yeah, then, yeah, you're, it's just nonsense. You have, for example, a modeling notation which does not allow you to experiment with the 
has real-time properties, yeah. and your system has real-time properties, then this assumption would be violated. Then if, this, uh, if these real-time properties matter, if you cannot just abstract from them, then, then indeed you violate this assumption. And then, yeah, it, it's, in the mathematical sense, it's just an implication of which the premise is false. It's a whole theory built on this assumption. Just in your answer, you just said, if, the, if these properties matter, yeah. real-time properties, that is probably encoded there in the in test, in the set of tests, right? Because you're not, this is too general as a, as a, an assumption, I would say, because you, there's no, there's no, no room there for abstraction in the sense that you're not saying every test uh, with respect to this abstraction level. You're saying in some sense every test. Don't you think so? I would say... You're right, yeah. You, you first have to like choose an aspect or, or a set of properties that you will be observing. And then your set of tests will be with respect to that. Yeah, uh, you're completely right. And so here you have to choose, actually, and I abstracted from that, but you have to choose the modeling language mod and the language of tests or your domain of tests together in such a way that this holds. Yeah? So if your modeling language, for example, cannot model real-time properties and in your tests you can, yeah, then this goes wrong. Yes? So they have to fit together. And indeed, that's related to the characteristics or kind of properties that you want to test. Yeah? If you want to test maintainability, or reliability, you get reliability models. And that's different from functional models. And you also get different kinds of tests and different kinds of observations that you can make. And finally, it has to fit together. But in my opinion, it is very important that if you do model-based testing, that you make these assumptions, as expressed here, explicit. Then somebody else can also check what kind of properties have really been tested and from which kind of properties did you abstract. Thank you. <coughs> so correctness of formal testing, and that's expressed here. Okay, so you, actually, that was one of the first slides. You would like that an IoT conforms to a specification if and only if the IoT passes all corresponding tests. But this is all in the real domain, so you cannot formally reason about it. You cannot prove this. And for that, you need this test assumption. And once you do that, you can prove this. So you assume that for the IoT there is a model, I sub IoT, that this conformance can be expressed by a mathematical or formal relation, imp, implementation relation, and that passing a test or executing and assigning a verdict to a test execution can be modeled in this way. And then you have everything in your formal domain. You can prove something about it. And you can prove then that this holds for all these classes of models, or for, all the, for this class of models. And you know then that you can really test and you can, uh, and you know the kind of properties or characteristics that you might conclude from your testing. And, and the importance, in my opinion, here is that you really should specify what kind of assumptions, what kind of test assumption that you really make in order to be clear what kind of properties that you test. Not the user of MET has to do it, but the methodology, no? Yeah, of course. Okay, that's yeah. probably... Yeah, yeah that's... Uh, this, this is a theoretical, let's say, under, underpinning. So. The, the developer of model-based testing theories has to think about all this, and as I will show at the end, then develops a tool, and finally the user of model-based testing just makes models and uses the tool to generate the tests. And the test implementer has taken care that all this holds, of course. But also the test implementer is very, should be very clear in which kind, for which kind of models it holds. And that's The user, finally, does not draw the wrong conclusions about his tests. Okay, this is all very abstract. I didn't say anything about the concrete models that I use. And actually, you can use different kinds of models. Uh, finite state machines or mealy machines has been around, have been around for a long time uh, for, or, uh, in order to do model-based testing. 
you can specify pre and post conditions, label transition systems, that's what I will continue with, or programs as functions. In the functional language community, there is also such a movement with tools like uh, GAST and QuickCheck, which use model-based testing, a kind of model-based testing in order to do, uh, to check their programs. Uh, there is, uh, are people doing it on abstract data types? All very interesting, but I would like to focus now on the model of labeled transition systems. That's a quite general model. So that's then the next topic of this presentation. Quite a general model uh, which can be used to model systems. So this was the picture as we just had it. If we now apply all this to labeled transition systems, then it means that our specifications are now labeled transition systems. It will mean that our implementations, or more correctly, the models of implementations that we assume are a special class of labeled transition systems, namely input-output transition systems. Also tests, we'll see, can be modeled as transition systems. Again, a special class of them, a restricted class, test transition systems. And we can also model then test execution as a kind of parallel composition of a test case and an implementation. And if we make all these choices, and I will show that at the end, then we can really get such a property, and in particular then for this IOCO relation that I will discuss, that an implementation is IOCO correct to a specification if and only if the generated tests or all generated tests uh, pass with that implementation. Label transition systems. Well, they are very common, well-used, uh, well-known uh, structures, mathematical structures, to model systems. They consist of states, consist of actions, transitions, and an initial state. And the idea is that the system always is in a, is in a particular state, then it can make a transition to another state, and while making this transition it executes a particular action. And this action is observable, or at least can be observable. Sometimes this action can, is unobservable. Then we have unobservable actions. And this is a general model which is quite often used in many model-based things, model-based verification, model checking, but also in model-based testing. Um, also here, labeled transition systems are quite powerful in the mathematical sense, but real systems usually have millions, billions, or even more states. So, if you make a model, most likely you will not do it as a label transition system itself, but you will use some language which has an underlying label transition system semantics. There are many languages, Promala, Lotos, I don't know what, which have um, semantics which can be expressed in these terms. And again, as a user of model-based testing, you don't need to be aware of un all the underlying theory, as I give it here, but you just have to use these languages. Label transition systems. Uh, for implementations, the model, so this test assumption that I use, is that implementations can be modeled as so-called input-output transition systems. What does that mean? These are label transition systems where inputs are always, all inputs are always enabled in all states. And this corresponds to what you usually see in software systems. Systems are usually always able to accept inputs. Perhaps they produce an error message as their output, but at least they have accepted this input. That's the assumption that I make. So here you see a simple system. There's something to point with. Not really. Okay, so here you have a simple system. It starts in the top node and it accepts a kwartje. Kwartje is a very old Dutch coin, pre-euro coin. Uh, and it goes to this transition. Here it can accept, again, some coins, doubletjes and quartjes, and at a certain moment it may produce T. I use question marks to indicate inputs, exclamation marks to indicate outputs. And I guess these are quite intuitive models of systems. For some reason in this world, at least by theoreticians, uh, ex as examples they always use coffee machines. 
it's a kind of tradition and I did not want to I wanted to stick to this tradition so here again coffee machines and you see here four input enabled ones and these loops indicate that they accept inputs and don't do anything and here is also one which is not input enabled and it accepts a double chain either produces tea or coffee and so if there is one state with two outgoing labels and then there is a choice you can either do the one or the other <coughs> okay so far models so we have specifications we have implementations our specifications that are the models for the model based test generation from which we will generate the tests and the implementations are the models that we just assume to exist in order to reason formally about model based testing then the next step is if you have implementation specifications we need to de define formally precisely what it means for an implementation to conform to a specification and that's where this IOCO that Wolfgang already mentioned pops up IOCO is a relation between implementation and specifications which specifies when the implementation is correct and it's formally defined here but I'm not going to discuss this I'm just discussing the intuition you can read these definitions in papers if you're interested the intuition is that an implementation is correct with respect to a specification if an implementation never produces outputs which are unexpected by the specification and so if the implementation produces at a certain state coffee as an output then the specification should be able to do the same perhaps the specification does more but it should at least be able to produce coffee we do allow so-called non-deterministic systems in which different things uh, are the same uh, sequence of stimuli might lead to different states there is one special output and that's no output if the implementation doesn't do anything so it's completely silent then the specification should be able to reach a state which is also complete where it's also completely silent yeah. so it's a kind of call it liveness constraint if the specification says you should do something then the implementation must really do something example I think that's the easiest to explain this so I have a specification which says accept a double chair also such a Dutch old coin and give me either tea or coffee and I have an implementation which accepts a double chair and then produces coffee and the question is if somebody specifies this and some implementer comes back with this implementation will he be fired or not but in other words is this a correct implementation of this specification or not yes well I think it is this implementation is Yoko correct with respect to this specification because the specification says accept and double chair as an input and then either produce coffee or produce tea so an implementation which restricts this freedom of either this or that to just coffee is a correct implementation so you see you can specify a lot of options and you have to implement only some of them this one with respect to the same specification except in double chip and produces tea or it produces chocolate, chocolate non-deterministically if you restart one time it will produce tea and the other time chocolate is that correct if it's only supposed to produce tea or coffee and it produces chocolate that's not what you asked for so that's not correct I agree another one it accepts a double chip and produces coffee 
But non-deterministically, it may also accept a double chain go to a state from where it does nothing. That's not what you want, eh? I guess. If you say either tea or coffee, then nothing is not what you want. And formally, this is incorporated in the theory by this quiescence. And we indicate it with the Greek letter delta. And we say this state is quiescent. So you can, in this case, indefinitely observe nothing. And this observing nothing is considered an explicit observation. Yeah? Think in practice of it as a kind of timeout. Now you, you set a timer, which is large enough, and then if you don't observe anything, you, cons you conclude this system is completely silent, and theoretically that's quiescent. And in this case, the implementation is quiescent, the specification is not, so that's not correct. Finally, this one accepts a double chain and produces tea, and it accepts a quatsch and produces chocolate. Yes? People in favor of no firing this guy who implemented this? I consider this as correct. And why? Well, the specification says after double G you should produce either tea or coffee. And that's after double G it produces tea, so. And the specification doesn't say anything about what should happen after if this other coin in Kratje is inserted. So an implementer can use this freedom to do anything which he likes. Or she likes. And so it accepts a Kratje and produces chocolate. It might also accept a Kratje and explode. Yeah? There's nothing which prohibits it in this specification. So you see, this Ioko relation on the one hand allows that you make choices. If two outputs are specified, you can choose one of them. Uh, restrict the freedom in that way, and in the other way, you, an implementer can implement more inputs. Uh, it accepts, specifies it should accept double chain and then do a particular thing. All other inputs, it doesn't say anything, so there is freedom to do something. So additional features can be implemented. <coughs> That's this EO correlation. For the more theoreticians, there is here a slide of, let's say, the history of Ioko, how it came to its present form. So it started with label transition systems that are models which are many years old, 50 years, I don't know exactly. And somewhere in the 80s, uh, Hennessy and De Nicola defined testing equivalences on label transition systems. So that's also 25 years old. That was very theoretical. Some more practical guys used this testing equivalence theory in order to define a testing theory, the so-called canonical tester theory, which was also quite theoretical, but at least gave some insight. On the other hand, here uh, in America, Nancy Lynch defined a model which is very close to label transition system, so-called input-output automata, which are actually very close to this input-output transition systems that I used. No? And again, some other people, Fritz Vandrager was it, who defined so-called quiescent trace preorder on input-output transition systems. So he was, as far as I know, the first to coin the term quiescence for transition systems. Roberto Sigala proved that quiescent trace preorder on input-output automata is exactly the same as testing equivalence on label transition systems. And so if you take label transition systems, assume that inputs are always enabled as in input-output automata, then you get exactly this quiescent trace preorder. More or less the same time, Ian Phillips defined refusal equivalence, which is also an equivalence on transition systems, systems but just a little bit stronger. Yeah? And then we combine this Quiet, uh, the principles of quiescent trace preorder with refusal equivalence, so refusal equivalence on input-output automata, and that gives a relation repetitive quiescent trace preorder. Well, how do you then come to Ioko? 
take the principles of this relation, take some principles of the canonical tester theory, make a kind of uh, mix out of it, and then you get this EO correlation. And so that has some foundings in all these things on equivalences on label transition systems. There's a huge literature on equivalences on label transition systems, for those who are interested. And it was very popular, in particular, somewhere at the beginning of the 90s. But at least something practical, at least I think something practical came out, the Ioko theory. When I defined this Ioko theory at the same time, there was a guy in France, Marc Fallipou, who was just a practical tester at France Telecom, and who later on, based on his practical experiences, defined also some theory and some relations, and he came to exactly the same relation, also this Ioko stuff which gave some co uh, confidence that indeed this was a useful relation. Well, finally, there's also a variant EOConf, but let's not discuss that. So that's, that's EOCO so far. EOCO is the relation which defines when an implementation is correct with the specification. As such, it, in principle, does not have, any, have anything to do with testing per se. It just defines correctness. It's much weaker than relations like by simulation equivalents, which some of you might know, which also come from this theoretical branch of equivalences on transition systems. Okay, specifications we have, implementations we have, we have a notion of correctness. Then the next one is uh, tests. We need to define what tests are. And as I already promised, tests are also just transition systems. But special ones, because... We don't have infinite time. We don't live long enough to do infinite tests. So tests need to be finite. So they are finite transition systems with finite behavior. So actually, they are trees. And actually, this already discriminates it a little bit from a lot of testing theories where tests are just sequences, sequences of things which you can, should do after each other. If you have non-deterministic systems, sequences are simply not sufficient because you give it a certain stimulus, and there might be different responses, which are all valid. And this leads to a kind of tree behavior. And that's what's written here. So, for example, this one, this test specifies that you insert a double chair, quart chair, and then there are different possibilities. Well, in this case, they, two of them lead to fail, and only one leads to pass, and you continue. But here you see, at this state, there are two reactions which are both valid. And that's normal if you have non-deterministic systems, that you have different kinds of uh, reactions. So these are tests. Specifications, implementations, correctness, tests. Then the question is how to generate tests from uh, specifications. And that's, let's say, the most important one because that's where you can earn the money. That's generating the tests automatically. And that's, in the Yoko theory, is done with a relatively simple algorithm which generates tests from label transition systems. This algorithm is recursive in the sense that you choose one of these three possibilities and two of these, you do something and then you do the algorithm again, the algorithm itself again, so recursive algorithm. It's non-deterministic in the sense that in each step you might do any of these three possibilities and all these three possibilities give a different test but all these tests are valid. And so basically, just a label transition system with one node, which you label with pass, is a valid test, or a sound test. Well, actually, you're testing nothing, but it's a valid test. A label transition system consisting of two nodes here, at least, where you do a stimulus A, that means the tester gives an input to the implementation on the test, that is, and, and that is the start of a valid test. If after that you derive a test from the specification, from all the states which you can be when you have done this A. And finally, you can observe outputs. That means you're in a state. You look in your specification what all the possible outputs are in your specification, and there can be multiple. For all outputs, which are not allowed according to your specification, so it means they do not occur in the specification, you immediately go to a state which you call fail. And for the ones which are allowed, 
you continue recursively with your algorithm. Here there is again a Greek letter, theta. This theta is the observation of quiescence. So think of it as this time out. And you, you observe quiescence, so you observe that the system is quiet, uh, quiescent. Yeah, this is the whole algorithm. Sorry, what is? What's the stop criteria? When you, where are you going to stop to take care of it? Or you are going to continue running? No, you're not going to stop or you are going to stop. That's up to you. This, in a certain sense, is a specification of an algorithm which gives you, because of the non-deterministic choices, a lot of different test cases. All these test cases are valid test cases to test your system. Yeah? The problem of selecting between these tests that's not addressed by this algorithm. If you want to test a function which takes an integer as input, whether you test it with 3 or with 4, that's not specified here, unfortunately. That's a big problem. I will come back to that. This, this algorithm in particular produces um, often the infinite number of tests. Yeah. 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 For any practical application, it produces an infinite number of tests. Uh, and the stop, and when you stop, yeah, if you choose this, this option, of course, and that's the stopping of, of this algorithm, but it produces indeed infinitely many tests. Yeah? But one of the underlying ideas of uh, many of the tools which are built on this is that you replace uh, a lot of thinking about selecting tests by doing just a lot of tests randomly. But guided, of course, by your specification. So, an example. I have a specification, I want to derive a test. First, I add these quiescence states in my specification because they can be particular observations. And then I recursively go through this tree, this specification tree. So in the initial state, there is just the action double chip. So the only thing that the test, or the only thing that the test can do is inserting a double chip in the system. Then the specification says that you can be in two different states. In the one state you can get coffee, and in the other state the system is quiescent. So there will be at least two outgoing states. Suppose that in the label set, so that you also want to test for, for example, whether T is produced, then in this case, if this is the specification, then T may not be produced, so T here leads to a fail state. But the observation of quiescence, indicated by this Greek letter theta, goes to a pass state, and observation of coffee also goes to a pass state, or you just continue with deriving a test. Once you're in this coffee state, you're, the only thing which is allowed is observing quiescence. So here you see that theta leads to a pass state, and tea and coffee lead to a fail state. If you have inserted one coin, one double chip, you should not get two coffee. And this test case tests for that. And because the only valid thing is here, that the system is quiescent. And in this way you can go through your specification and make long or short or whatever test cases. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good thing, but the, the thing that's confusing me is that in the jail one for the T, uh, you are going to get, for example, T, chocolate, all those things that are going to fit. And this is going to waste a lot of time for you, in order to do looking on that, just these failing things, because you are going to Sort of always, always generating test cases which are going to fail. And you don't want, and all of these test cases, they are looking like the same criteria, the same thing. So why, why we need to look at all these possibilities that are going to fail and I don't care about them? What do you mean, going to fail? So, so for example, in the, in the, the middle one, the T1, that's the yeah? fail one. So, so there is a, a lot of things that are going to fail like this. So the chocolate, the fail one, yeah. the failure one, the other one. Well, you're in the test, you're in this state. Yeah. Then you s observe the system. Mm -hmm. The system produces coffee. That's okay. You continue. Yeah. But now the system produces something else than coffee or, uh, yeah, in this case, quiescence. Yeah. Think of it as an otherwise branch. Then immediately, if you observe something otherwise, you can stop with this test. Uh, I see. You can you can actually comprehend this a little bit if 
you have a pot of coffee and tea, then you have 10 other possible. Anything else needs to fail. Only one copy and part is okay. But also, also these are output from the system. So yeah. this is not something you're going to actively test. If you have a thousand things there, then you, you just wait for something to happen. If it's copy, you'll accept them. If it's any of the thousand things there, you, you'll fail. But you won't do one by one for all of those, because those are output. Clear? Well, suppose you have this test, and now you have an implementation which looks like this. Then you can apply this test to an implementation. And, and mind, this is not the real implementation, but this is the model which we assume to exist. And so the real box behaves like this. Then it will do something like this. So either you just compose them in, in theoretically in parallel, so you just uh, look for pairwise the same transitions. So in the first one, double cheer is the action, and then you can observe quiescence if the implementation goes to the left branch, or if the implementation goes to the right branch, you will observe uh, double cheer coffee followed by quiescence. In this case, you have two possible test runs, and they both lead to a state of the test which is labeled pass. And the criterion is that if all test runs lead to a pass, then the whole test passes. Yeah? And because we allow non-determinism, non it can be that if you repeat an experiment, you get a different result. In principle, you have to repeat these things. You have to repeat your test several times, theoretically even infinitely many times, but OK, we don't have time for that. And you have to make some fairness assumption that indeed, if you try it often enough, that it will indeed show all possible behavior. And then the result, and that's the theoretical result in a sense. So as a user of model-based testing, you just are aware of this result, but you don't have to do, you don't have to bother about that. The tests generated with this algorithm are sound. And all possible tests that you can generate with this algorithm together they constitute a so-called exhaustive test set. Sound means that if you detect an error, you get a pass. You're sure that according to the Ioko relation, you indeed have an error. And exhaustiveness means that, in principle, that for every possible error, there is a test generated with this algorithm. And but there, and that was already mentioned, that was your question, it's an infinite set, so in practice you will have to restrict, you have to select. But actually, as far as I know, there is not a really well-founded theory of test selection at the moment, which really gives you criteria other than just heuristic criteria for test selection. And so what we do and what a lot of other tools do is uh, yeah, a kind of random approach. You just walk through your state space, you generate a lot of tests, you take care that you do not take the same states again and again. And in this way, you hope to cover your specification. And, but if you want to write a PhD, then in the area of test selection, there are certainly a lot of possibilities. Uh, what about domains for input? Where do they fit? Are they part of the model? When you say, let's say, for exhaustiveness, that there must be a generated test that detects any incorrect implementation, what inputs? Uh, what inputs? OK, that's a good question. That's uh, if you, you make your models. You make transition systems. You assume that your implementations are modeled by particular transition systems over a particular label set. Yeah? And this is the assumption that you have to make, or assumption, this is the choice you have to make. And so I'm coming from uh, the protocol area, communication protocols. So you take all possible messages that you can generate, for example, as input space, which you can divide in valid messages, unvalid, and such kind of things. Uh, but this, indeed, you have to define in advance. It's the label sets of the label transition systems. OK, so far, theory. And of course, what do you do with a good theory without a tool? Nothing. So a lot of people already came up with model-based test generation tools. 
This list is certainly not complete, but well, they are some of the approaches and some of the tools that I'm aware of. Spec Sharp is, of course, also there, but I'm not going to talk about Spec Sharp or Spec Explorer, but about Torx. You see, I added one because it's not completely on the right spot anymore. Um, Torx, that's the little tool that we developed at our university to implement this Yoko theory. Torx is a tool which generates tests from label transition system specifications. Actually, not from label transition system specifications, but it takes some of these languages, and in the moment, these languages are being supported, languages, modeling languages, which have label transition system semantics. It generates tests, and it immediately executes them. That means it executes, it, it's an on-the-fly tool, or call it lazy. What does that mean? Torx each time looks in the specification about what's possible, about what's allowed, and immediately executes that. In this way, you can avoid part of the so-called state space explosion problem. If you have a label transition system, I already mentioned, real systems have really billions of states, sometimes more states than there are mole molecules in the universe. Yeah, you cannot represent that. By doing it on the fly, you don't have to generate that in advance, but you generate it as far as you need it. Actually, the same principles, and for example, in the evaluation of lazy functional languages. And you just evaluate or you unfold your label transition system as far as you need it, you derive a test so far, and as soon as you have enough information, you immediately offer the inputs to the IoT, you observe the results, and again you compare it with what your specification prescribes. And of course, observation of an output of outputs means observation of real outputs or the special output quiescence. Um, here I have a simple example. Because of time, I will go through it a little bit fast, I think. So what does Torx do? It looks in the so-called explorer, which is just an unfolder for your language towards label transition systems. It looks for the menu of possible actions. It selects an action. It translates this action, gives it to the IoT, observes the result, translates it back to the modeling language, and compares it with the specification. And so what are the, the prime components? Explorer is a kind of unfolder for label transition systems. Primer is this test generation algorithm. Primer driver is just the main thing that drives the thing and keeps it running. And adapter is a test environment. Because we are making abstract models, for example, we have a concept of the number three. three. But as we saw it here already, the IoT only understands bit strings. So somewhere you have to translate the abstract concepts which are in your modeling language to the real things which are here. And in this respect, you at Microsoft have an easy job because everybody here does uses just .NET. <laughs> okay. At least it is, in a certain sense, a restricted environment. But if you go, for example, to the embedded systems world, then the interfaces and the way that you can communicate with your implementation on the test are very diverse and sometimes can also be very complex. So making an adapter in this world is certainly not an easy job. Well, you can again select something, observe the action. In this time, it's a timeout. That's the real thing. And the modeling or the abstract thing is a quiescence. And again, you compare that. And in this way, you see... You can just, already with these simple transition systems that I took as examples here, you can walk through them and do tests of a million test events without problem. And in the little Torx tool, you get a user interface and you see something like this. So Torx, what it is doing, it all the time compares what's really happening with that, what should happen according to the model. And so in, here in the upper window, and here in this state chart, uh, in this, uh, what is it, in that chicken chart, you see all the time what's really happening, and here you see all the time what's the actions which are really allowed according to your model. And as soon, of course, if there is a discrepancy between the two, 
you'll see a light flashing and you see that it's something wrong. With torques, we have done a couple of case studies and you see uh, they're mostly from the more, yeah, call it embedded world or more technical world, control systems, communication protocols. The last one was quite interesting, but I cannot say anything more about it than it's written here because it's very secure. It's the Dutch electronic passport where we did a little bit of testing. Some of these case studies are more interesting than others. But I would like to say a few more things, so I do not consider them in detail. If you're interested in one of them, let me know. What I would like to discuss is a more, few more general lessons from this model-based testing case studies. Now, the context is that these case studies were usually performed in a, in a cooperation between our university and some kind of company, where mostly people from the university did most of the job. The first thing is about the model construction. In the beginning I said the model is the basis. You make a model and that's the basis for model-based testing. That's easy, sa easily said, but not so easily done. Because making a model can be quite complex, in particular if there is not enough information. And usually, in a lot of companies, I don't know whether that's particular for this embedded world where we are mostly in, but specifications are not complete or are too old. Um, so making a model is not always very easy. You have to find a lot of ways to, to, detract, uh, to, to make the model, find a lot of ways to get your information. And in particular in the beginning when you do testing, if you find an error, then in, let's say, at least 70 or 80 percent of the cases, the error, or at least the change you required, is not in the system that you're testing, but in the model because you did not understand the things. You go to the engineers who made the product, and they say, yeah, but it should be like this. Oh, it's not in the specification like this? Okay, then the specification is wrong. Yeah, by definition, usually engineers say that the product is correct. Another thing is, uh, this modeling is quite a, a nice exercise in the sense of finding errors. We did a few case studies where actually the most important errors were found during the modeling exercise. You, you model, and you discover, hey, this cannot be right. And we did a payment protocol, electronic payment, uh, where we modeled the protocol between an electronic purse and a kind of, uh, yeah, uh, what was it, uh, a computer where the administration was taking place. And we modeled it and we discovered, hey, this cannot be a correct protocol. We did some model checking and indeed we proved, using model checking, that money could simply disappear. Yeah? And in electronic payment systems, the most important invariant, of course, is that the total amount of money should be equal, always. So that was, and then also some other examples we had this experience, that actually this modeling gives you the most important things, and not the model-based testing. So that's about specification. Adapter and test environment, I said it already. In our environment, it's quite a burden to each time develop such an adapter the connection between the formal model-based testing tool and the real system on the test. But yet, once you have it running, usually you can do very long tests, which by definition are then also correct. And once you want to do different testing or a little bit different setup, you just change a few parameters and you can just push a button and go home again and come back the next morning and see where you are. And in this way you can really do, well, half a million tests, sometimes up to a million of test events, uh, on, a, on a simple system. So you get very many tests for free and it's reasonably flexible. And the last remark, I mentioned that already, coverage or a notion of test selection, which test is better than the other or which one should I execute, that's not a really well understood problem yet. And so we just do a lot, a million test events and then we hope we have covered a lot. Yeah? particular in the case of testing non-deterministic systems, this is not very long. If you just have finite state machines, without, um, they basically have only inputs to the system. You have all this, you know, link coverage, fast coverage, pairwise link coverage. So you have, you have a lot of uh, traversal techniques on finite state yeah. machines, which are well understood for over decades or so. Yeah, they are well understood. Looking at the non-deterministic systems, you have 
choices, and so then, then it's uh, getting problematic. Right? Then it's getting, in particular, problematic, but also the other techniques are well defined in a certain sense, but not really well understood. I do not completely agree with that, in the sense that everybody agrees you should have full path coverage, but the number of paths is as infinite as the number of traces. Yeah? And what approximates path coverage best is not completely clear. There are people talking about statement coverage in a lot of these things, or if you have models about uh, state coverage or transition coverage. There are others you are using UIO kind of methods, which do more than just transition coverage. And the comparison between these mo methods and which one to select, there are also no real criteria for that, as far as I know. And there are a lot of papers about one is being stronger than the other, but which one to take in a particular situation. Well, these are very defined, but uh, the actual effect on the coverage of the yeah. <laughs> Did you talk about uh, test-based modeling that followed there? I, I didn't. No, I didn't mention it, uh, but it is related to the point that was for one case study we discovered here we really don't have enough information in order to make the model. And there we try to reverse the problem. Okay, we have a system, the engineers, it's correct. Let's try to build a model by, by testing it. Do experiment and try to build the model. We are still busy with that. I cannot talk about results, but it, in a certain sense it might look promising. Yeah, black box. So you do experiments on the black box system. You try to build a model from the experiments that you do. And in particular in this case, the people uh, where the engineers are busy restructuring the system, they are building a new version of the system which should have the same observable behavior. So in that case, we would like to use this model to test that. But also, I mean, in a lot of situations nowadays, Every month there is a new version of mobile, cell phone, software, or whatever. Once you have a starting model, you can try to use it to test new versions. And that's, but it's really a point where that we started because at that point we didn't know how to get our models. Okay, do I have time to say a few words about, about a few variants? So the basic thing is, we have transition systems, again a coffee machine, a few states, and there's a nice theory how we can derive tests. We can prove soundness, exhaustiveness of this theory, but real systems are not like this. Real systems, for example, do not have just actions, but they have parameters in actions, and they have guards on the transitions. So, for example, not just money, but a certain quantity of money. What to do with that? Of course, the naive or straightforward way is just unfolded. And that's how all test tool or, or most of the test tools nowadays work. But, of course, you get enormous number of states, transitions. State space explosion is one of the problems. And the second problem is related to test selection. If you unfold it, you lose all structure. You don't see anymore that actually here... You have, let's say, two states, or meta-states, or locations, or whatever. And you lose these cards. And if you want to do test selection, this might be important information. Um, at the moment, a lot of groups, at least four, are working on real time. So not only you want to know the sequence of actions, but also the time at which it occurs. A new branch, and tomorrow somebody will talk about it is hybrid. So, for example, if you have a coffee machine, you do not want only to see that I get the action coffee, but here you have a differential equation which describes how the quantity of coffee, for example, increases. And finally, money is just money, but usually you insert money by inserting different coins. So-called action refinement. And after the first coin, you might, for example, uh, abort the whole sequence. If you just abstract from these details, you will also never test that in model-based testing. Because you get the tests of the model, yeah, or which you model. I mean, if you abstract from certain details, you will also know, get no tests for these details. So how to deal with such kind of things? 
And these are all, let's say, current research themes. One, and this is just to impress you with a lot of formulas, but I will talk about this tomorrow, is about the data part, where we try not to unfold, but to really, on a higher level of abstraction, deal with data in a symbolic way, just like, for example, in uh, symbolic uh, execution of programs. Another one is where you have multi-channels. So here we had input, output, but you can also imagine that you have systems where you have multiple channels, and each of these channels separately can be quiescent. That's a variant which has been defined, Miyoko it's called, and, so, and it means that, for example, it can be that there are still outputs on this third channel while this one is silent, and that you can observe that, for example, in a distributed environment. And you cannot observe whether the whole system is silent, you can just observe your local channel. An important thing is component-based testing, and there, in Yoko, it's not always good. Look at this. An implementation specification. It's just like the coffee machines. I specify that either this or that should happen. I make a choice. After the button, I just, in the implementation, produce an error message. I have another one, which accepts the error message or an OK message. If it's an OK message, it produces X, error message Y, and that's a correct implementation of this specification. So I have a system I1, which is a correct implementation of S1, I2, which is a correct implementation of S2, two components of my final system. I combine the systems, where they communicate among each other on this uh, OK and error message. <coughs> I do the same with the specification. But unfortunately, the resulting system is not correct. So I have two components with are both EOCO correct. I combine the two systems, the implementations as well as the specifications, and the result is not EOCO correct. Yeah, and indeed, that's something you can prove. EOCO is not, as it is defined now, um, fit for compositional testing in this sense. What should you do? And that's also something you can prove. I mean, you can prove that you have a problem because you have such a nice mathematical framework. And you can also prove under which restriction it does hold. And in this case, it does hold if you make your specifications also input complete. So if you specify for each possible input what the required reaction is. And then the compositionality does hold. And that's a good argument in order to make always complete specifications because which piece of software nowadays is not component of a larger system. It's always good to be as complete as possible. Finally, but that's a technical detail then, I propose because of time to go to conclusions. So, the concluding things I think, it's my opinion, but fortunately, more and more people think that way. Testing not only can be formal too, as Marie-Claude Cordel once said 10 years ago, but in my opinion, it should be formal. You sh testing should be more precise. You should define more formally, more precisely, what you are testing and how you got your tests and what the properties of those tests are. In this respect, testing is not just an algorithm on a model, but it is an algorithm on a model of which you have proven certain things. For example, soundness and exhaustiveness. Do you really test what you want to test? With respect to an implementation relation and a test assumption. And I've shown for label transition systems how implementation, specifications, and tests can be modeled, that you can define a test generation algorithm which indeed has nice properties, and that there are tools which currently implement that tools, let's say academic prototypes at the moment.
And this is how I see the perspectives for model-based testing. At the moment, there is a lot of attention for model-based testing, and I think that's good. There is still a lot to be done, but I think the current tools, if you're willing to invest a little bit, are worth trying and do give you a lot of value for money, and sometimes even no money at all, because usually they are uh, open source. And so the model is a, apart from model-based testing, also gives you a good value, because you can do model checking, you can learn a lot about your, your system, design errors you can find. Once you do model-based testing, you can get long, cheap, and a lot of, uh, of or long, cheap tests, and moreover, reasonably flexible. One of the problems with testing is you change a minor thing in your implementation or your system, and you have to redo your whole testing process. In model-based testing, it's easier to adapt your model and just get your test for free again. That's, I think, one of the big gains that we might expect from model-based testing. But it's also clear, one of the first slides, model-based testing cannot replace the complete testing process. You need at a certain point to have a model. At that point you have already some idea of what the system is going to do. Testing with respect to the, uh, let's say, informal user requirements, validation tests, cannot be done with model-based testing. So you need more but it can replace quite a lot of testing in a completely automatic way. Questions? Apart from those already posed. Then I would like to thank you.